One. Welcome to Tony Martinetti Nonprofit Radio coverage of Fundraising Day 2012. We're in the heart of New York City in Times Square at the Marriott Marquis. My guest right now is Jennifer Herring. Jennifer is President and CEO of the Maritime Aquarium at Norwalk, and her topic is Major Gifts 2.0, Street Talk for Your Board. Jennifer, welcome to the show. Thank you very much, Tony. I'm glad to have you, and, and thank you for taking time on a busy conference day. A pleasure. Why don't you acquaint uh, listeners with the work of the Maritime Aquarium? Uh, the Maritime Aquarium is a regional aquarium located in Fairfield County, Connecticut, that serves primarily Connecticut and Westchester, but the whole uh, tri-state region. It's focused on Long Island Sound. In fact, it's the only aquarium focused on Long Island Sound. Our mission is to inspire people of all ages to appreciate Long Island Sound and protect it for future generations. We have a wonderful collection of Long Island Sound animals and a lot of ability to touch and directly experience animals. It's a very intimate aquarium. Okay. And we also have a very large education program that reaches out primarily to underserved students around the tri-state area. And how long have you been there? I've been there for going on eight years now okay. as the CEO. Okay, let's get into uh, your seminar topic, Major Gifts 2.0, uh, Straight Talk for Your Board. You're encouraging gift officers to be change agents around board fundraising. We're, we're, we'll have plenty of time for detail, but generally, what's, what's the problem that you see? I think that the challenge with boards is to keep them engaged. Getting them on the board is only step one. All fundraising, especially major gifts fundraising, is about personal relationships. And just like any friendship, a personal relationship needs to be cultivated and maintained on a continuous basis. So you can get getting people on the board is the first challenge, and right. I'll talk a little well, bit. Yeah, we, want, we want to talk a little about recruitment. We'll get exactly. there. Exactly. Right. But once they're on the board, keeping them engaged, uh, challenging them with meaningful ways to be connected with your organization is an ongoing challenge, and the, the strategy behind that is something that the development officers sh can and should play a significant role in. Okay. Um, uh, let, let's, t let's talk a little about the recruitment mm -hmm. of, of board members. Um, how do we make plain what the fundraising expectations are at the recruitment stage? Oh, I've done that for many, many years. Uh, there's always a conversation. You know, once you've met the person, cultivated the person enough so that you're at a position to have a conversation about whether they want to join your board. And of course, that person has to be somebody who's passionate about your mission and somebody who is going to bring something, either some expertise or capacity or preferably, or a network of contacts or okay. preferably all three uh, to the nexus of issues that right. the, the organization so, so is dealing with. So you've ensured that the person you're recruiting is bringing something, what one, one two, or all three of those. Absolutely, because of now, course the ideal board member brings wealth, wisdom, and work. Okay. And we want to engage all three. So you're having the conversation, and it's almost always a conversation, at least in my current job, between me, right. sometimes with another trustee, and the prospective person. And I just lay the expectations out on the table. Now, we have kind of a sliding scale of expectations, depending on the capacity of the person. Okay. The board has voted. This is a small organization. It's about a ten and a half million dollar budget. And how many trustees are there? There are at the moment thirty one. Oh, there that's large. Could that's be. A, that's a lot. That's a, a lot of trustees, partly because in a cultural institution, being on the board or on a committee of the board is the only way you have a connection. There are no grateful patients. There are no alumni. You have to create a connection and keep it going. Okay. And the board is a very important way to do that. So. Getting back to the recruitment conversation, right. uh, I always put a specific number on the table. Um, and it can be as little as the minimum annual gift that the board has voted mm -hmm. should be the minimum, which is mm -hmm. $2,500. Um, often I will say, cite a larger annual gift if I know the person has more capacity, right. plus either giving, uh, uh, giving or selling a table to the gala and then we've been in a campaign mode for the last five years I usually say you know once you've gotten involved and and 
been a member and really gotten connected, we will be coming to talk to you about a major gift. Okay. And the first number, that's an annual number? That's an annual number. Right. Okay. So you're very clear about the expectations. Do you do, you do this in writing and let the person take it home, to take it to their office and consider it? Or this is really all verbal? Uh... Well, what we give them in writing, we don't give them the expectation in writing. Okay. We give them the role of the board, you know, what, what our expectations of them are in terms of their uh, responsibilities and what they can expect of us in terms of responsibilities. We give them a lot of background material about the organization. We let them see who their colleagues on the board would be. We give them a board list. Uh, but we don't have, you know, a pledge form that they have to sign beforehand. We figure that the verbal conversation is enough, and then we solicit them uh, at the at year end or fis- calendar year or fiscal year end. We have a June 30th fiscal year for what we've talked about. All right. Now you have a new board member. They've they've accepted based on the expectations. Uh, what does uh, board training look like for for brand new board members around fundraising? Well, we don't have a really formal training process. Maybe it's on the job. Maybe they, they go on other calls. But they go on calls with others. Or What we mostly do, we have a, a pretty elaborate committee structure, one of which is a, is a campaign committee, but a marketing committee, a finance committee, a, a education committee, and exhibits committee. So we use those committees to get them connected with the meat and the program of the organization. We use the gala committee uh, very actively to um, engage people in soliciting tables for the gala. That's in some ways the easiest kind of fundraising to do because it's very transactional. Mm -hmm. Then there's a a certain uh, small cadre of leadership um, volunteers who have made major gifts and who are in powerful positions in the board that I work with personally to develop specific uh, ask strategies that they participate in uh, to go on call, fundraising okay. calls with so me. So there is some, that's sort of on the job, I recall. It, it's on, yeah. Yeah, okay, so it's on the job training because yeah. I've, I've found, I've worked at now four nonprofits and I, in none of them has there ever been, you know, you get the whole board together and you have a little fundraising training thing. We, we tried to do that actually in a retreat uh, in 2008, the, the week that the stock market was falling apart when we were about to launch our campaign and had a little role playing about how you ask. But that... Contrived, right? It's Every, quite everybody contrived. Knew it was, everybody knew it was, it was staged. It's quite yeah, contrived. That's my experience. And I've found right. that it's much better to work directly with a person who's agreed to go on a call with you. And what I do is write a script for that person. And I do it for myself, too, about you know what the objective is, how much we're going to ask for, what the background is, uh, the, you know, the background research, the relationship with the person to the organization, and then what each of us is going to say. Yeah. Uh, so, so do you actually rehearse? Since you have a so script, do you, do you practice the meeting in advance? I, well, I practice myself. I mean, I okay. sit in my office and speak the script, yeah. and I often will have a telephone call with the person who's going with me to, to go over it, and they use these scripts. They work really well to shape the, the conversation, and you know, it's sort of various um, whose mouth the actual ask is going to come out of. It most often comes out of my mouth, okay. even if we're going with a peer. Uh, but it doesn't matter, really, because the presence of the peer there makes all the difference. Right. And why, why don't you say a word about that for people who may not recognize? What, what's the value of having uh, someone, well, someone alongside with you who's a, a peer of the, of the person you're soliciting? So having somebody who's involved, who's already made a major gift, who's giving their time and, and treasure to the organization validates the organization for the person that you're asking the money for and sets a bar uh, for, 
for what they're doing, especially if it's a trustee, because the trustees are supposed to be the ones who care the most, who are the most invested, mm -hmm. and therefore need to be the biggest investors in the organization. And somebody on the outside of the organization is always looking to how much trustees are doing and how much in particular that the trustee who's asking uh, has done to help scale their level of, of gift thinking. So, okay. so here's an example. Uh, actually, this isn't a trustee. It's somebody who's, whose son is a trustee and who I've tried to get a trust, to be a trustee for years has taken on the project of raising money for a new research vessel, which is a $2.5 million project. He's in the shipping industry. He's very passionate about it. He co-chairs the committee. He brought in the person who's um, project managing the project, who's built many boats. Mm -hmm. He helped move us to the decision away from retrofitting an old boat to building a new boat from scratch. He agreed to raise the money. He gave a half million dollar lead gift. And I took him to see uh, a prospect that's been in our family at about the $10,000 level for a number of years, who we honored at our gala, who we've cultivated pretty thoroughly, and whose connection to the aquarium was around our existing research vessel. Okay. So we went and sat with them right before Christmas in their kitchen, and uh, the gentleman who's leading this project talked about it very passionately, talked about what he's done. In that is instance, the actual ask came out of my mouth. We left them with materials. But then the leader, the, the um, head of this effort, played golf with the prospect in Florida, continued to cultivate him on his own, separately from anything that the institution was doing, and this gentleman stepped up with a half million dollar gift. Oh, matching the lead gift for the matching project. Matching the lead oh, gift. Outstanding. So it it's, was a long cultivation effort, probably going on for five years before we got to the critical moment where we found the right project that connected to this person's passion. And I'm sure that the fact that he was being solicited by somebody else who had made a gift at that level was one of the things that determined. Yeah. Uh, his, I mean, this is somebody with a lot of capacity who's named things all over town. Um, and this also speaks to the value of the long-term relationships that that you mentioned. Now, that may not have been a long-term relationship, but it was the beginning of it was the beginning of a relationship well, well, between those between those two. Between those two, absolutely. Yeah, and I mean. and there was the long-term relationship with the institution. I mean, this gentleman yes. had that the person who made the five hundred thousand dollar gift had been involved with the institution for at least five years. Sure. But between and, these two people, right. A developing relationship. Correct. See each other as peers. Right. And uh, makes it tougher for the person solicited to, to refuse. The other thing, usually, is that when you're going to have a solicitation call, the person that you're soliciting knows why you're coming to see them. It's not a surprise. Right. They and certainly they should. Don't, we, we don't want to be blindsiding people. We want them to know. Right. I mean, you yeah. basically set up the meeting in a way that says, I want to come and talk to you about this project yeah. or this campaign or so that they know what it is. And if they don't want to be solicited, they won't take the meeting, mostly. Right. Let's talk about the role of uh, the professional fundraiser mm -hmm. in supporting board fundraising. What, what do you see as the, the, the role? Well, acquaint people with the structure at the aquarium. Do you have a vice president or director of development? Yes. And we then have, there are some gift officers? Or how? We have a, well, we have a very small development okay. office. We have a, a highly experienced director of development who's been doing university development heading university development departments for 30 years. Right. We have uh, a person who does foundations and a lot of uh, the patron program and various other many aspects of fundraising is sort of the, the director of the annual fund, but he's also doing major gifts, so it's not very... Okay. Everybody does Typical of a small shop. We have yeah. a, a person who does the galas and corporate fundraising. We have a person who does membership and the acknowledgement of gifts and uh, some fulfillment of patron-level gifts, which is $1,000 for us. We don't have very many patrons. And and that person has an assistant, so it's okay. basically five five, okay. five people, and there are other things that are being done right. out of this department so as well. Who, who uh, is the liaison to the board for fundraising? I assume it's the, the it's the director of, the director of development, and to some degree the the person who manages uh, the gala because the board is so involved in the gala. Okay. So, and and also 
the, the person, oh. I would say that there are three of our gift officers that, that have relationships, not with every board member, but with some okay. board members. And then since your, your, your topic is major gifts, right. what's, the, what's the support that the director of development probably is the one providing to the, to the board around, around major gift efforts? Well, the rec- director of development is mostly providing support to me around major gift activities, and that's possibly because I have such a strong fundraising background okay. as a CEO. I mean, that's what I've been, my career has been for 30 years. Um, so we talk about strategy. He identifies prospects, uh, re- does the research. He does a lot of personal cultivation with these people, too. Uh, so he makes friends with them. He talks about his travels, their travels. He fixes them up with theater tickets. He does things that just brings them closer to the organization. He's very active in working with the board on small, intimate uh, cultivation dinners. Uh, so that's something you ask board members to do? We ask host, board members to events in their hosts, homes? Not in, the, not not in, in their our homes? home. Oh, okay. We host them right in front of our biggest exhibit, which is a shark oh, tank. Excellent. Yeah. So you're, you're having dinner with a shark swimming around right. in this elegant table. There's, you know, a maximum of 20 of you. There's some interesting intellectual guest, either a professor uh, from Yale or the principal of our partner school that's closing the achievement gap or somebody like that. You're there with a bunch of peers that the board members bring to the table. Um, and that's part of the cultivation effort that's proven very successful and really important in moving people into major gift relationships with us. Yeah. Okay. What, what do we do with um, or for board members who have a reluctance to do fundraising? Now, even at the... So even going back to the... Uh, to uh, bringing them on bringing them on the board, uh, the recruitment, if they express a reluctance, they, they, they have skills that you need and they're willing to do their own giving, maybe at a, maybe at a, a much higher level than the $2,500 minimum, but they have a reluctance to do... to be asking people for money. What, what can they be doing around fundraising? Uh, we just don't bother with them because we don't have time, frankly. Oh, you wouldn't accept that kind of a board member? No, no. We just leave them alone to do oh. what they're doing. Okay. Okay. And don't try to make them do something they can't do. But even if they can't ask, they're not comfortable asking, they could, for instance, host the host right. an event. So that's... We're constantly uh, trying to get people to bring their friends to our events, to our friends' events, okay, our exhibit so. openings, introduce people to us and every year when we have a board retreat they all the people there pledge that they will do that and every year only a few of them do it um, we're definitely working very hard to get board members to agree to host or co-host these small dinners our shark tank dinners and bring oh, that's great they're called shark tank dinners yes oh, isn't that great yeah, yeah. Uh, I just read something online that if there was one drop of blood in one million drops of blood or something like that. A they shark can sense it. Can from sense a it, from a mile. Mile. Yeah, yeah. Was that on NPR's website or something? Uh, it could be, but that's something that, that one of our education programs demonstrates okay. to kids. It's oh, really? very interesting oh, yeah, how they yeah. do it with a little drop of tomato juice being diluted and diluted and diluted and and they figure out when they can't taste it. And Okay. Yeah. So your Shark Tank dinners. So we're constantly can... trying to get board members to bring their peers to Shark Tank dinners, which is very difficult to do, and only a few of them are really able able to leverage those kinds of relationships. It's, uh, you know, we have a, in some ways a naive board. This is not New York City, and this is not New York City fundraising with the kind of power boards that I've worked with at the New York Public Library and the Wildlife okay. Conservation Society. It's a very different kind of board. Maybe uh, many of these people are being our board members for the first time. Some of them are, you know, business people, maybe in the upper middle management of a bank, and they're, they they don't have the kind of reach into rich people community that um, that is common in New York. On the other hand, Fairfield County has a huge amount of hedge fund wealth and a huge amount of maritime wealth, although in this economy that's less than it was. Uh, and we are getting more and more of those kinds of people on our board who do have a network and are, are able to 
to bring us, at least to get this, us in a room with them. Okay. Then okay. the challenge becomes how to convince a sector that is more and more about venture philanthropy that has measurable impact that there's something for them at the Maritime Aquarium. Yeah, uh, and, and uh, well, we want to stick to the board fundraising topic, but I know that impact and outcome assessment is a, a very, is Huge. very important for lots of charities, and it, yes, it, and it is. is a struggle for cultural institutions to, to do that, although right. it sounds like maybe around your education initiative. We do. We are uh, able to do that around our education and shifts and initiatives in some very interesting ways about closing the achievement gap, and one of our trustees made a very strategic gift to us that allowed us to do uh, a case study about a partner school that we're working with mm -hmm. and what impact our partnership has had in their achievement, their rise in achievement, a school that's almost all inner city kids. Jennifer, uh, we have just about a minute left, okay. and I want to talk a little about the case for support and, mm -hmm. and, and analyzing that case for support. Right. Again, in just a minute or so, what's your advice around scrutinizing that? You need a strong case for support. You need your board to be able to deliver it in an elevator speech uh, so that they can be great ambassadors for you. Uh, the case for support is what's going to make people give. They have to understand that you have to teach them through your case for support that you are an institution that can help them change the world. That they can change the world through your institution and get the joy and satisfaction of doing that through their philanthropy. The, uh, the elevator speech for board members, do you help them write it, rehearse it? Yes. Do you talk about what yes. should be in it? We have definitely done that and we've done it in various ways. But the elevator speech should have a certain set of statistics and I've actually gone so far as to, to take a business card and write them out that they can keep in their pocket, okay. those statistics. But the elevator speech also has to connect to the passions of the board member so that they can talk about the institution in a way that, that communicates the passion that they bring to it. So every board member doesn't have the same elevator speech? No, every board speech. member d doesn't and shouldn't have the same elevator excellent, speech. Excellent advice. Okay. It goes to what, what's, what moves them the most. What moves them. Right. We'll have to leave it there. Well, right. thank you so much, Tony. My pleasure. Jennifer Herring is president and CEO of the Maritime Aquarium at Norwalk in Norwalk, Connecticut. Pleasure. Thank you very much for joining me, Jennifer. My pleasure. Thank you, Tony. This is Tony Martinetti, nonprofit radio coverage of Fundraising Day 2012. The Marriott Marquis, hosted by the Association of Fundraising Professionals, New York City Chapter.